This is Jocelyn Hall with the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. I'm here today on April 1st, 2019 in Muncie, Indiana, talking with Naomi Lehman. I would like to begin by asking you where and when you were born. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, April 29th, 1985. All right, so your birthday's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so tell me more about what it was like growing up in Louisville. Um, well, so I, I grew up in uh, Charlestown, Indiana, which is a small town um, right across the river, basically, Louisville metro area. Um, and my parents, well, so we moved to the house that my parents live in now when I was four, so basically still, you know, go home to my childhood home. Um, we spent a lot of time, my sister and I, I have a sister who's two years older, um, we spent a lot of time outside and, you know, playing outside with the neighbors and um, my mom's really into gardening so we would help her with all sorts of gardening projects outside. <laughs> um, so can you tell me the names of your parents and your siblings? Yeah, um, my dad David Lewis and Renata Lewis and my sister Adrian Hester. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tell me more about, you know, kind of activities that you did. What was your highlight? What did you look forward to after school? Things like that. Um, yeah, so let's see. I well, I was always involved in a lot of sports as a young kid, so I did, you know, cross country and track, and I think I tried basketball one year, which was a huge failure. Um, volleyball, also not not a success. Um, I stuck with cheerleading. <laughs> that was that was what I was good at. So did a lot of um, like gymnastics type stuff, um, and our cheerleading team was. By the time we got to high school, we were pretty competitive and did a lot with that kind of stuff, you know, going to competitions around the state and, and cheer camp and stuff like that. So that was, yeah. So what was middle school like for you? Was it an awkward puberty time or was it, were you flourishing? No, it was pretty awkward. Um, so sixth grade, so I went to school in Charlestown in my hometown, which was a very small town, like, you know, a few thousand people. Um, and I went to middle school there. And then in seventh grade, I switched over to um, the local Catholic school. Um, so it was like, you know, 25, 30 minute drive from our house and very, very tiny. The junior high at, at Providence High School, junior high was very small. Um, so there were probably like, you know, 50 people in the whole junior high amongst seventh graders and eighth graders. So it was, it was tiny and it was a good experience, but it was, I was sort of the newcomer because um, all the other kids typically had gone to school together at the other um, Catholic schools in the area, and they all kind of fed into this one um, high school, and I hadn't gone to school with any of them, so kind of like, you know, seventh grade, pretty awkward time, you know, thrown in with a bunch of people you don't know, so, um, but it, it was good. I mean, it, overall, it was, it was definitely a good place to go to school, but... A change. <laughs> what kind of student would you categorize yourself as at that age? Um, I was a good student. I mean, kind of the nerdy, the nerdy, like <laughs> always doing my homework and taking school very seriously. So <laughs> yeah, my parents stressed that a lot. So that was always expected, you know, just that, that we would get good grades and, and keep on top of everything. And so my sister and I both complied with that expectation. <laughs> and you mentioned that you went to Catholic school, so was religion a big part of your childhood for your parents and for yourself? You know, interestingly, I would say no. Um, so we were kind of all over the place with religion. Um, my dad was Presbyterian, his family. My mom was Lutheran, and her family was all Lutheran. And we kind of switched churches when we were kids and so we never I never really got that like deep commitment to a church or like you know that kind of family feeling um and then I actually throughout my childhood I um every summer I went to the Episcopal church camp um which I loved and that was amazing and then I was a counselor there through high school and yeah it was just through high school once I got to Ball State I didn't go back there for the summers um but yeah, so I would say that religion was influential on my life, but then I, maybe there was just such a mix that it, I, I never personally became very religious, so that's, yeah. 
You mentioned you went to summer camp. Was that the majority of your summer? Did you ever go on vacations? Or? Yeah, it was just one week out of the summer, typically, when I would go to camp as a kid. Um, yeah, and we would we would usually go somewhere else during the summer, too. Um, my mom, like I said, she was really into gardening, so she always loved to, well, and my dad's really into history, so whenever we'd go on any kind of trip it was always you know like let's go tour this historic home or see this garden or you know so a lot of that as a kid but usually mom liked to go to the beach like at least one time during the year just a kind of you know the typical do nothing vacation type thing so we'd usually have like one more educational trip and one more just go to the beach and hang out trip <laughs> so. would you say then that money was um not an issue for your family yeah, for the most part, yeah, not not really an issue, yeah. Did you mention your parents' jobs? I did not, no. no. Okay. Um, my dad is an attorney, and my mom uh, was a librarian at the high school, the local high school, so. Okay. Um, and then just talking about kind of world events at the time, was there anything that stuck out to you that you remember from the 90s? Uh, from the 90s? Let's see. I was going to say 9-11 when you said that. Right, um, yeah. Just because, yeah, that's when I was in, in high, high school, school. And I remember, you know, very distinctly that happening. And, you know, they came around all the classes and, like, turned the TVs on. And, like, you know, everybody was watching it. And just, I remember all that. But from the 90s, hmm, what were some major world events that were <laughs> that were going on <laughs> so I have just a few things that I thought were interesting number one being um, Bill Clinton becoming president how did did you ever did you even like think about that kind of stuff I don't not him becoming president I don't think I ever really you know thought of that I do remember the whole like um, oh I remember the OJ mm. I was gonna say the Monica Lewinsky uh, stuff too I do remember that but I very specifically remember the OJ trial. I think I was in fifth grade. And I remember they were, we watched that at school too. Like the, the final, um, you know, the verdict and everything and, and just how shocked everyone was that, that he got off. And <laughs> that was, I do remember that. But yeah, I mean, I vaguely remember the, the Monica Lewinsky stuff. But I think, yeah, I, I think at that age, I just didn't, didn't care too much about news and, and world events, if you will. <laughs> so so um, you kind of touched on 9-11. Do you feel like that kind of impacted your high school experience at all? Or you, did you have fears of war breaking out or attacks or anything else like that? I would say no. Um, no, I don't think it, you know, surprisingly, it didn't have that much of an influence, I guess. I mean, I, I think it made it m more into focus and, you know, it made like the military, because I think, you know, you sometimes if you're not involved with the military on, on a regular basis, like you, you kind of forget about it and, and things that they're doing perhaps. Um, so I think it, it brought that more to the forefront. Um, so maybe, maybe it did have an impact and I hadn't really, never thought about it. <laughs> Um, so one other thing was I found in the 90s that the the web was launched. Did you have internet access in high school or how did you do your projects, things like that? Yes, yeah. Um, I do remember, like, <laughs> my dad always joked the worldwide wait um, and you'd, like, log on and do all the little dee -dee 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 -dee, and then make the noise and <laughs> you'd wait and wait and then the connection would get lost. And then nobody else could be on the phone because you were through the phone line and yeah we would get on and like you know AOL and I am with your friends who you just saw at school and then you have to get on at night and message them um but yeah I remember starting to do research online but with my mom being a librarian you know she always encouraged us to you know go to the library and, and find the sources and so that was something we always just grew up doing because we'd go into her library with her like during the summers when we were little and help her you know with whatever we could do at the, whatever age we were putting books back on the shelves or organizing things or something so um yeah 
Um, so going into high school, you went to Our Lady of Providence High School in Clarksville, Indiana? Yep. Um, so tell me what dates were those. Do you remember the years? Um, let's see. When did I start? I graduated in 2003, so I must have started in 99, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so can you walk me through a day in the life of your high school experience? Like what, what activities did you have after school, things like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, it was, you know, about 30 minutes from our house. Um, so, and my sister was two years older. So most of the time, because I think she could drive by the time I started there, she drove me to class or we caught a ride with the kid down the street. <laughs> but yeah, so we'd, we'd get into school. We had the best principal and he would always be at the door, at the front door, greeting everybody. And I swear he knew everyone's name. Like there were five to six hundred kids in the school and I think he literally knew everyone's name and greeted everybody as you came in in the morning um and then yeah it was it was the building was older um and we didn't have air conditioning so the on some summer days we would get out early because it would get so warm so you know that was the best thing ever if you got a <laughs> um, a heat day as they called it <laughs> um but yeah, and then I typically would have cheerleading practice after school, and our cheerleading coach lived literally right adjacent to the school. Like her backyard opened up into the field. Her husband was the football coach, and she was the cheerleading coach. And so we would, you know, kind of go over there and hang out for a little bit until practice started. And then I guess my mom came and picked me up some of the time. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that, but yeah, I'm sure that's what she did until I could drive. Um, yeah. And I, let's see what else. I was involved in several things in high school, but really it, cheerleading was kind of year round throughout high school. So that was the main thing. Like, and we would do, we did a lot for all the teams. Like we would go in and decorate the locker rooms and like just a lot of other things like that but my favorite class was always art class I think I took an art class every semester had a really great art teacher um, that yeah he, he was very influential in in my life I think giving me the confidence that I you know was good at art and you know could do something with that so that's yeah what were some of the projects that you did in your art class um, so he had some really interesting, like one semester he did like a jewelry class. And so we got to, you know, make rings with a gemstone and I mean, not like a nice, you know, like a stone, I guess, <laughs> not a gemstone. Um, but you know, silver, working with silver, um, we did a lot of painting. Um, what else? Oh, we, we had to make like a hand sculpture at some point. Um, so, and I'm pretty sure, actually, I just went through my closet at my parents' house where I had all this stuff stored and, and found some of these art projects and just was like, wow, this is really where I, you know, started my love for drawing and which has really turned into what my career is now. So, Would you say that's the closest you've come to an architecture class in high school? Yes. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was about the was probably the most influential and I, what made me think to go into architecture was really I loved art classes but you know I liked math and you know other other classes too and I thought well architecture seems to combine you know the math and the art side of things so this seems like a good a good fit so that that was really what my thinking was I can't say that I knew it just sounded cool too I mean <laughs> you know you think oh being an architect sounds sounds really interesting so <laughs> and I, I you know when you're in high school you don't you don't really have any concept of what a career is besides what your parents do or besides teachers you see what teachers do but you 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 know you really don't know what other careers will entail so I think you're just kind of going on what you've seen in uh, on tv or in the movies or something like that <laughs> Um, so we talked a lot in, in our honors class right now about how um, 
some honor students feel like they're kind of um, not like the rigor of the classes isn't up to their standards. Is that how you felt in high school? Yeah, to some degree. Um, that was also part of the reason that I went to that Catholic school instead of um, going to the local public school. Um, my, my mom worked at the local public school, Charlestown High School, and she thought that it wouldn't be, you know, they didn't offer a lot of AP classes and they didn't offer a lot of other honors classes or, you know, joint with the local universities, things like that. So I think my parents felt like I would get a better education at the Catholic school and, and have that more challenging. And so I, I feel like, yes, actually, high school was the appropriate level of, of challenging and and that was that was good. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself struggling in a class? Um I don't think so. Not in high school. No, not really in high school. I'm trying to think. I mean there might have been, but it's not not coming to my mind right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think in high school. <laughs> um, so your school was kind of in the middle of a small town, right? So, well, the um, actually the the Catholic school was kind of right in the middle of like the three major cities in southern Indiana. It's like New Albany, Clarksville, Jeffersonville. They all kind of mesh together, and they're right just north of the river of Louisville, Kentucky. So, it's all kind of in that metro area. So would you say there was more diversity than average? Uh, no, not at our school. <laughs> no, there was not much diversity at all. <laughs> um, how often did you come in contact with people who were not Caucasian? Um, I'll be honest, not much, probably. I mean, really, especially at high school, I think, I think literally we probably had like three African-American students at our school, so and that was about as diverse as it got. So there, there wasn't a whole lot, <laughs> to be honest. And yeah, I mean, I think in Charlestown where, you know, where my parents live, not a whole lot of diversity there either. So yeah, not, not a lot, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Um, so when did, when did you get your first job? What was that like? Uh, let's see, I think I was like 15. It was in high school, um, but I worked up at, it was called Humor, Huber's uh, Family Farm, and I just like served drinks, not alcoholic drinks, but um, just like filled, it was a, basically a venue for parties, and so I would just work on the weekends, like getting, helping people get their drinks and, and serving food, essentially. Not like a server, it was, it was actually very easy but um, <laughs> I guess that was actually now that you mentioned it that was one encounter with more diversity because a lot of Mexican um, people worked at the farm and um, a lot of the employees there were, were Mexican so that was and the, uh, you know they spoke a lot of Spanish and so I didn't know any Spanish I took French in high school so I was always kind of clueless as to what was what they were saying if <laughs> if it wasn't in English so and during that time, did you feel like you had a lot of friends? Did you go to prom, homecoming games, things like that? Yeah, yep. Yeah, we were a pretty close-knit high school, and, um, yeah, everybody was, was pretty close. Um, yeah, I went to prom. Um, I think, actually, I think senior year, I think I was on the homecoming court both seasons. I never won, but... <laughs> um, yeah, we were, we were a really close-knit close-knit group. I kind of changed friends throughout high school. I kind of started when I freshman year, had one group of friends, and then kind of became closer with the cheerleading group. And then by high school, it was really myself, Melissa, and Brittany um, were, you know, really close. And actually, they both ended up coming to Ball State, so all three of us came to Ball State together. Um, so, and Melissa and I were roommates, and then Brittany ended up leaving after a semester or after a year I can't remember but yeah she ended up moving moving back home after that so. um, and then going sort of into college what was the expectation like did you always know you're going to college yeah yep um, always knew I was going to college yeah and my parents never pushed one college over another to us you know I mean I and with my sister being older and she went to Purdue um, and my dad went to IU, um, 
so it was, it was never like, oh, you should, you know, I'm a huge IU fan or whatever, and you should go here. It was, it was really whatever suits you best and whatever you want to study. Uh, but yeah, we, I remember going in when my sister was looking at colleges, you know, touring. And so I, I, I went along on a lot of those and got to see different campuses and get a feel for it. And I went and visited her at, at Purdue while I was still in high school and while she was up there. So, When did you first hear about Ball State? Was it from any, you know, um, teachers, faculty members who went there? I, let's see. So it was, I'm sure it was from, probably from our guidance counselor at high school. We had a really awesome guidance counselor that knew all of us and was super helpful with all the applications and um, of course with my mom being in school system too she was you know very cued into all of that type of thing too application deadlines you know make sure you got it all together and tests you need to take and that kind of stuff um, but yeah and I think once I got interested in architecture you know then it really narrows it down so I, I knew I was applying for architecture schools so I looked at Notre Dame, Ball State, and uh, University of Illinois were kind of my my top choices as far as, I, I, I think that's basically what I narrowed it down to in the end. So. Did uh, money ever play a role in choosing Ball State or like how, how did you choose? Yeah, it did. Um, since when they offered me the Whitinger scholarship, um, that made a huge difference just, you know, knowing that all of all of undergrad would be paid for. That was just seemed like such an amazing opportunity that didn't want to pass that up. So that was, and I mean, of course, in addition to be, I was impressed when, when we came to look at it and had the interview for the Whitinger scholarship, which was like, I'm pretty sure in January, you know, of my senior year. So, and just thought the faculty were great. It was honors college faculty that I met first and thought they, it seemed like a really nice place, so that made a big difference too. So, what was that like? Um, who did you talk to to get the Whitinger? Did you apply? Yeah, I, I honestly don't remember how that happened. How the application, you know, I don't remember it. How, if you had to apply separately to the Honors College, and then if if you applied separately for those scholarships, I, I, I just don't remember, but. Um, yeah, I, I do remember coming up for the interview because it happened to snow like eight or ten inches that day and like school was canceled and both my parents had come up with me and, you know, they'd taken off work and then Ball State, everything was closed and so and the professors that were supposed to come and do the interviews were snowed in and they couldn't get out of their house but they were like, and so we got here and the door, all the doors were closed and, you know, nobody was around. We're like, oh no, what are we going to do? <laughs> here we are. And, and so somehow we got in touch with somebody or they got in touch with us and the professors ended up coming in. And I think maybe it was somebody who lived closer and could, was able, you know, the roads were cleared or something that they, they were able to come in and, and do the interview. So. Um, so it's okay to do a humble brag for this part, but I think only like 10 students are chosen for that per year. I think, yeah, um, I think. So why, why you? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly. I, I don't know if it was, I do remember at the interview, um, he, he asked me, and I cannot remember this professor's name, I wish that I could, and I looked through all my notes and stuff to try and find find some more names, but um, uh, he asked me what my favorite book was, and I said, I couldn't choose, uh, you know, how can you choose one favorite book, and he said, you know, that was the answer I've been waiting for, that <laughs> I hoped somebody would say that, <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, I don't know if that made some, some influence, but, <laughs> yeah. And so when you were the summer before coming to Ball State, what were you most afraid of? Huh. Oh, the summer before. Let's see. What was I doing that summer? I'm sure I was working at camp. 
um, I was a counselor there probably most of the summer. I don't know. I was really never afraid of being homesick. Mm -hmm. I just never really feared feared that, and um, I don't know. I can't I can't think of anything that I I was afraid of. Maybe just the you know the thought of like meeting all new people, which is somewhat exciting, but also somewhat scary. So, and just knowing, I mean, I knew. I guess it was good for me because I knew I was going to have two of my best friends there, and you know, Melissa being my roommate, it was going to be an easier transition than some people. It wasn't like I was going to have a totally random roommate or something like that would would be worrisome. <laughs> but mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me more about what dorm life was your freshman year, sophomore year. Yeah. Um, you know, I honestly don't think I spent much time in the dorm because in the architecture program, I spent most of the time in studio. So, and I, I feel like, so my, my friend Melissa, she was not in architecture. Uh, so she spent a lot more time at the dorm and it made a lot of friends in the dorm. And actually she ended up becoming an RA and... So she had dorm life for several years, but, <laughs> um, you know, I, we had, back then it was the Z-shaped rooms. I don't know if they still have those, but so like our beds were in the corners and then our desks were kind of out in the middle. But, so I do feel like that was better than just the box rooms. You had like a tiny bit more privacy, but <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I know I didn't enjoy dorm life, I didn't enjoy the communal bathrooms, that's for sure. Um, that's probably the worst part of dorm life. So the next year I, I moved off campus and moved into a house and still shared a bathroom, but it was a little bit more private. So. <laughs> and how did you get involved with honors? I know you got the scholarship, but how did you first hear about it? Probably my guidance counselor. I don't, I don't remember like the first introduction to it really but um yeah I just I, I remember th it was always you know if it was Ball State it was always going to be part of the honors college and just knowing that it was going to be you know a few few extra classes or a few different classes but um yeah I guess it just kind of was part and parcel and I didn't really think about Think about the honors college as a separate thing. It was just part of Ball State in a way. And you went from a private Catholic school to a somewhere near the 20,000 range student number. What was that like? Yeah, well, I think that honestly, both the honors college and being in the College of Architecture made that transition much easier because both of, both the honors college and CAP are so family, like a family, you know, I mean, it's, it's like you have that more smaller classes and more one-on-one -on -one attention and you get to know your professors better. And it was definitely such a different experience than what I saw my sister having at Purdue. She was in um, like biology and pre-med and you know, just huge classes with hundreds of people. She didn't know any of her professors, you know, never had one-on-one -on -one time with them, except for maybe, you know, one or two classes. We were talking about it the other night, and she was like, I don't remember any of my professors' names. I was like, I remember, you know, most, most of my professors and a lot of small classes. And so I think that, that really made a big difference. So. And were you generally on top of your classes your freshman year? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, I've always been really organized, so that was something that just, I mean, I think, tend to stress out if I don't have something done, or I'm definitely not a procrastinator. It's like, I'm, I'm a preparer, and, which can be a fault at some times, but <laughs> not very good on the fly, but um, I will come prepared, so. <laughs> and what was there to do in Muncie at the time? What were your weekends like? Yeah, what? Well, my weekends were probably in studio, <laughs> but 
well, I do remember, and it might not have been freshman year, but later on, like going out to Minatrista and on the Greenway, um, my friend and I trained for a half marathon, and so we were out on the on the Greenway a lot, and that was when downtown was kind of just coming back too. So we'd go out downtown sometimes too, and, and check out the restaurants and bars over there. Um, and I don't know if it's really come back now, but. I guess too, it was just a lot of, you know, house parties and other other people, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember doing any sort of pranks or any super fun activities out of the ordinary? Um, no, nothing like pranks. No, I'm not, nothing's <laughs> ringing a bell there. <laughs> okay, um, so tell me, why do you think architecture is so time-consuming compared to other majors? I think it's partly self-inflicted, but <laughs> I, it's also, I think, because you have that space. Like, a lot of majors, you don't have this space that is, like, yours, and you can, you can come here and work on stuff at any time, and, you know, it's open 24-7, and I think that partly makes you more likely to just be there it's also I think the you know it's a small group that your section or your class group gets pretty tight-knit and I mean a lot of the time you're not always working up there it's <laughs> you might just be hanging out or not getting not being super efficient but um but I think that's also part of like the creative process of it all like seeing what other people are doing and and you know getting involved or helping them or whatever it might be but I mean I think the the projects were time consuming as well and well because we had studio every like Monday Wednesday Friday all afternoon like one to four so it's just time wise it is actually more more class time than you know some some majors potentially like, whereas other majors might be at home studying or something, like, we were in in that studio class, so. Did yeah. you ever regret choosing architecture, or did you love those long classes? Yeah, I didn't mind it. I mean, I think it, it, it came with, you know, so many other positive things, just the, the tight-knit community and the fun of the creative side of it was was definitely worth it to me so and I think it, it is you know that kind of life is representative of what you do in the career field too so it, it is it, it's a good it's a good preparation if you don't like that aspect of it while you're in school then you probably aren't gonna enjoy doing that as a profession and in 2006, 2008, you were the Sigma Lambda Alpha Landscape <laughs> Architecture Honors Fraternity Vice President. Wow. <laughs> so what was that like? Uh, yeah, I don't think we did a whole lot. <laughs> Can to be honest here, yeah. Um, and I don't think that's when we started the... We, we started at some point a, um, a publication of student work called the perennial of um, landscape architecture student work. The architecture students always had um, a, a student publication and landscape never did. So we started that and, and put a lot of effort into that. And I wonder if it's still going on, <laughs> but um, that was a lot of fun just to, as it was mainly a showcase of the senior seniors work, like their, their final thesis project or capstone project. Um, but we, we put other, I think maybe all grades, everybody could submit to that. And yeah, and that was, that was a good project. Why did you feel like it was important to have that? To work on that, that mm -hmm. publication? Um, you know, I think it just, it's one of those things that sort of helps support other, you know, students as you're going through. If you can see that see your work in print and it's sort of a celebration of, of what all the hard work that you're doing and shows that the faculty care and that you know the other students care and want to see your work and it's also inspiring for 
you know, the younger students to see what the fifth years were doing. You know, you grow a lot in that time frame and your skills get a lot better, your rendering skills, your just creative ideas. And so I think that was that was really important. And in your classes, do you feel like you were more of a leader or were you more of like, was it, was it hard for you? No, typically not. Um, some of them were, but I would, I would say I probably was more of a leader. Um, most of the classes weren't, weren't overly hard. And I, with my, you know, art background from high school, I think I, was you know kind of went into some of those classes a little bit easier like learning the rendering techniques and some of that stuff the drawing classes um i was i always really enjoyed those and it just sort of came more naturally to me so that was and that's you know that was really my passion about it that's what i really enjoyed so and in 2007 you got a scholarship for your commitment to career related to the environment how did you get that? Um, was that the Udall scholarship? Is that uh, the one? You... I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was actually thanks in large part to the Honors College. Um, the advisor um, Barb Stedman, mm -hmm. she was super helpful with all those kind of um, scholarships and opportunities and things. And so I'm pretty sure that she suggested that because two of us from landscape architecture, another girl in my class, Lauren, got it as well um, that same year, which I think they were, you know, kind of surprised that two people from Ball State got it um, that year. But I, I think she suggested that we apply for it and um, she helped us with the application. And actually I was just going back through some of my notes and saw that, because I was on, on the world tour during that application period. And, you know, it was like emailing her from some stop in, I don't know, Spain or <laughs> Rome or I don't know where we were, but yeah, we had internet very intermittently and just emailed her back. And <laughs> that's, I found out on that trip that I'd gotten that scholarship. So cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to flip back and go back to, or back to honors and then we'll cover the world tour. Okay. Kind of thing, cool. Just cause I don't want to skip over that. Yeah. Um, so why did you choose to continue with honors when you were so busy with architecture? Um, I, I really did enjoy the classes. Um, there were, yeah, I think they were all really thoughtful and honestly it was just something different than what I was doing. So it was nice to kind of have that, mm -hmm. you know, get your mind working in a different way uh, as far as uh, instead of just being focused on design and architecture and drawing and, you know, you get so entrenched in that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it was definitely a lot more literature based. I mean, I remember the first couple classes were, and then I did a philosophy class on evil. Um, and that was, I remember that just being such a super interesting class. And basically we'd have a lot of reading to do. I remember that too, that it was like a ton of stuff to read, struggled to get, get through it all, but um, I'd always read at least at least part of everything, <laughs> and but then we'd and in class we'd always just have the best discussions. You know, it was just it was a really small class, maybe ten or twelve people, and it was just discussion based, and you know, discuss what you read, and then we wrote papers about it. But that was I remember that as being a very very thought provoking class that I always look forward to going to. And did you find yourself participating in discussions or mostly listening? I would say pretty even mix. I'm I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert, so sometimes when it comes to that, I'm I tend to stay quiet, but I think in those small groups it's easier to for everybody to have have their chance to say something. Okay. And so, were there any intense discussions in any of your classes that you remember? I don't remember any um nothing that that stands out as as a debate or something no and how did the diversity kind of play a role in honors not necessarily in um color but in like perspectives lifestyles things like that yeah i think and i think that some of the classes tried to bring that to the forefront and make us really think about that i i think it was the honors like 189 199 
where we've read a lot of books about immigrants and, you know, different backgrounds, family history, uh, things like that. And, and then the final project was a paper about our own family. And I think I'm pretty sure we shared all of that information with the whole class to, so that we'd all talk about it and, and understand each other's families and stuff. Um, and one project in that class, I'm pretty sure was, it was a bring in a family recipe project. And we made a, a recipe book with that. And I still have that recipe book. It's still like with all my recipe books. And <laughs> um, so that was also interesting. And I remember the professor brought in something that her family would always make. So I think things like that, you know, helped us understand each other and, and, and understand the diverse backgrounds. Do you feel like it, there was ever a moment where some, something that someone said or did change your perspective about anything? can't think of any moment like that but probably in that philosophy class though but it's not like one moment that sticks out just kind of okay. all the discussions in general and do you remember any of your professors names um any mentors things like that um well yeah I mentioned uh Barb Stedman she was the mm -hmm. advisor um I did see in my notes that the philosophy class was with Dr. Fry um so, but no, I, I don't remember a lot of my honors college professors' names, and I didn't didn't have them in my notes, surprisingly. So, mm -hmm. and did you have any like major project other than your thesis? Um, do you have any major projects that you remember? Yeah, I did an interesting project that I just found again. Um, it was on the importance of play, and I think I don't remember how that project came about exactly, but it tied into my landscape architecture background and so the end product was like the design of three playgrounds that would encourage an imaginative play in different settings like backyard you know a suburban setting and an urban setting so and that was interesting honestly just to look at that again because in my professional life I have done some you know playground type designs and just interesting to go back and see that all that that research and, and thought on that so yeah so I'm thinking like honors is like a kind of separate um side of the brain that you're using it's more creative and it's more um liberal arts side do you feel like that was a good balance for you yeah yeah definitely and and just the thoughtfulness with the bringing the different perspectives and the different literature you know, having the chance to, to read all that is something that, and have the in-depth discussions about it as well, which is, I think, brings so much more than if you just sit down and read a book on your own, you know, without the other people to discuss it with and hear their perspectives. And so, yeah, it, it has been, it's been a good, a good balance and kind of a good, like, trains you to think that way too, so... Is that how you feel like honors affected your other classes or was, did it affect your class in any other ways? I think so to some degree, yeah. And I noticed too, going through my notes, that you know the honors professors were so good at, they really read all the papers and they made a lot of comments and tried to help you get better at, whether it's just your writing style or you know other content or you should think about this or add more detail here. Mm -hmm. So I think that that has really influenced me in, to become a better writer. I do a lot of that in my professional life too. I write a lot of like long-term master plans. So trying to bring in all the different perspectives and, and like citing your sources, how important that is and <laughs> some things like that too. And um, did you have a lot of friends that were not from the Honors College? Most, I would, I was thinking about this. Most of my friends were from, from architecture, um, from CAP, but the other friends that I had were from Honors College. Or it was like the kids that were CAP and Honors, we, we were all good friends too because I think we were all kind of going through 
all the additional requirements of honors plus the architecture stuff. So that, yeah, but most of my friends were architecture related. So how do you feel like the non honor students viewed people who were in honors? Like we were nerdy, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I mean, like, why are you doing extra, extra stuff kind of thing? But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It wasn't, I guess it wasn't something that was like probably other kids didn't know that you were honors. You know what I mean? For the most part. So it really, it didn't, didn't have a big impact, I think, as far as, you know, what other people thought about you. Okay. So you never felt bullied or intimidated or teased? About no, it? no. Okay. Yeah. And also because I think a lot of, there's a lot of honors in CAP or there were, so it was fairly normal. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use any of the projects or books that you read in honors, like in a CAP project? I don't think so. I think, I don't remember that's that play project. I don't remember how that came about, but I obviously like wanted to work in landscape architecture things and do the design for that. So that was really the, the overlap that, that I remember from where the two, two things intersected. Right. And so you graduated in 2008. And so the how the honors house was that in construction at all? Did you know, were you aware of that happening? I was not. Nope. I didn't, didn't know that was happening. Yeah. Everything that we did honors college related was in Carmichael. Um, the offices were most of the, I think most of the honors classes were over there too. I remember at least four of them were over there. So I'm pretty sure that's where most, most of the honors stuff was happening over there. And did you ever talk with or have any contact with other Whittinger scholars? Yeah, um, I think we actually possibly met like on a yearly basis. Um, yeah, so I, I did. And then the year behind me, it was another girl from the area where I grew up. Um, and our parents knew each other and um, her dad was an architect. So I had interned at her at his firm. So I knew her, she was a couple of years behind me, but, um, yeah. So did know, know some of the other Whitingers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then did you ever have any field trips, immersive learning classes in honors, stuff like that? In honors? I don't think so. We did field studies every year for, um, for the college of architecture, but through honors, I don't think so. Um, so tell me about the world tour, how long it lasted, how you prepared, yeah. how you got involved. Yeah, so the world tour was a semester long. Um, it's kind of just this, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but just this amazing trip that you heard about as soon as you got into the College of Architecture. And it doesn't happen every year. It's like every two or three years. So you, you just hope that your timing is right, that you can – you be able to go and, and not miss other essential classes that you may not be able to make up for in those other years. Um, but yeah, so the semester prior to the world tour, we had a class. So there were 33 of us students on the trip, all from College of Architecture and Planning. Um, and so the, that semester before we prepared by practicing field sketching, that was a big part of of the world tour, um, researching the places we were going, uh, just getting prepared, thinking about safety while you're traveling and, you know, having the proper gear because we were going to be carrying all of our stuff for those three and a half months. So, um, yeah, just preparing for that. And then I think we left like January, early January, uh, 2007, we got back middle of April. So it was, it was the full semester and it was 25 countries um like 50 some cities and yeah it was it was an incredible trip by far you know the most influential thing that i did while at ball state i mean understandably so but um yeah i would say that's that's probably had the biggest 
impact on my perspective and and mm -hmm. shaping who I am from 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 a design perspective and also you know just a a life perspective. <laughs> Was that your first time out of the country then? No, the, my first time out of the country was freshman, summer of freshman year. I did a minor in French, and I studied in France that first summer uh, for six weeks. That was my first time out of the country, and that was, that was an interesting experience too because um, I, I signed up for this trip through Ball State through, um, or through an exchange program or something that I found out about in French class here, and... Uh, I, so I took French all through high school. I have not, I'm not very good at foreign languages. Just, it doesn't come very naturally. And I'm very, I'm good at, you know, reading and kind of doing the academic side of things. When it comes to conversation, I've just always been very hesitant and it's been hard for me. And I think I get embarrassed that I'm like trying to think of the words and it's going slow and, you know, you feel bad. The other person's just sitting there waiting for you to come up with the right words. And um, so that's been a challenge for me um, but so I went on this trip without knowing anybody else that was going to be on the trip so that was a little scary you know just getting on a plane and flying to France and not knowing anybody at 19 years old but it turned into a really fun summer so was... what was like the highlight of the trip um I mean it <laughs> I have to admit it wasn't class we didn't do a whole lot of class but uh just all the traveling around two of the other girls that were in the the program we became good friends and we would travel every weekend go somewhere else and we went down to monaco and nice one weekend and yeah and then we took the train going the wrong way we thought we were going to go back up to where we were staying we ended up taking the train towards italy instead and we ended up in this at the last stop like middle of the night it was you know the tra that was the last stop. The train was done running for the night, and we ended up in this tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, like in between France and Italy. I don't know which we were in at that point. And somehow one of the girls, she was she was a little bit older than me at the time, but she like we went into some bar and she talked this guy into like driving us back home to our place in Nice, and I, that was probably a terrible idea, but it worked out. So <laughs> yeah. That was, that was one, one thing we did, but yeah, we just, we would go somewhere every weekend and yeah. Was it mostly around Europe or did you go outside just anywhere? Uh, on the world tour was mm -hmm. everywhere, but yeah, in that France summer was, was just, just mainly we stayed in France. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I, I'm kind of switching back and it's forth okay. here. Um, but the world tour was all over the place so we the world tour started in Europe we went through Spain and France and um, let's see where if I had had it all in order here Italy and then Greece and then over through Turkey and over to uh, like Abu Dhabi and Dubai Egypt we went to Egypt before that and then on to Asia and through Thailand uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, back up through China, uh, Russia, and then back through like Northern Europe, um, Norway, um, and then Poland and like Austria, Germany, you know, back through France and England and back around. So yeah, it was, it was an incredible trip. So I found I don't know if it was a blog or it was on a story that was written about you, but you said that um, sketching was greater than or better than photography of sceneries. How did kind of sketching come? Like, what was your passion for that? Yeah, so that was one of our, that was kind of like our daily assignment when we were on the world tour was to keep sketchbooks and um, just sketch whatever you would see. Because that really in architecture, obviously we sketch a lot for, just for projects and being able to express your ideas through sketching quickly, you know, show it to someone and say, here's, here's what I'm thinking. Um, so we spend a lot of time developing that skill, but the world tour, I think is really where I, I hone my skill for sketching and, and that, cause I mean, I, I sketched 
constantly. <laughs> it was, I think it just helps you remember places so much better when you take that time to sit there and, and, you know, it takes you 30 minutes to get, get a sketch of whatever place you're looking at or whatever building, but you can really look at the relationships. I think too, like if you're sketching the facade of a building, you can, you have to like lay out all the, the relationships of the building, you know, this windows, three quarters, the height of the overall, and you kind of see all that and you kind of internalize it. And so I think that helps you when you're designing something later on, whatever it is that you have, have seen these relationships and, and how things go together. And I think it just gives you a greater appreciation for the things you're seeing. So I, I still sketch a lot and, and still really enjoy it. So that's, I, I should have brought my sketchbooks from the world tour and <laughs> showed those. Yeah. <laughs> what was the country that most inspired your current work or your work after the trip? Yeah. Um, I think the most inspiring country just in general for me, uh, was probably Cambodia. I, I think too, actually this kind of goes back to the philosophy class on evil because we'd studied all of that. And then we went to the killing fields in, in Cambodia, you know, and kind of saw all of that and the history of Pol Pot and some of that, just seeing that in, in real life and then seeing how, you know, kind and open and just how recent history that was, but how kind the people were, you know, even with that being their parents' generation, you know, it didn't, they didn't let that ruin their worldview or like, you know, let get hung up in that. It's like, you just move on and, and make the best out of life. So I think that was, that was really interesting. And just how generally, you know, Southeast Asia, how happy the people can be with so little and how we get so hung up in materialism and, you know, keeping up with the Joneses type thing that it, it really, that's not what happiness is about, that it's just about, you know, being content with what you have and you, know, have, you have family and you have friends and you make the most out of it, so. So how was it coming back from the world tour and going back into normal classes? <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, it was interesting, I guess. It was, yeah, you just think like, wow, that was such an incredible experience. And uh, yeah, I, I just had one year after that. So it was my final year of mostly landscape architecture things, but you definitely had a feeling of just wanting to go traveling again and have the, the constant change that that trip was, you know, it was cause every, every couple of days, really, we were moving somewhere new, catching a flight, catching a train, different city, new place. And we'd usually start with, they would take, you know, we'd do a tour bus style overview of the city. And then we'd have a day or two just on your own, go see what you want to see. Some, in some countries, it was more organized because, like China, they don't just let you do that. You're like on the tour bus the whole time, and they're taking you to the this factory and you know this place to sell you something and <laughs> organized meals and that kind of thing. But typically, in other in in Europe, basically, we kind of had free reign to just go to whatever museums we wanted to go to or see whatever architecture neighborhood we thought was most interesting. So. That was that was cool too and just figuring out your way through the city on your own you know don't do something stupid and don't get lost and <laughs> don't forget your passport <laughs> we had that a couple times so <laughs> um but yeah so going back into your time at ball state as you were wrapping up what, what would you say was the most comfortable place you could go to just feel like you were yourself probably studio, you know, just having, having your desk and studio that was kind of your, your little home base. And I'd say I spent most of my time at Ball State and in studio in the cat building, there's kind of the common spaces there too, but 
mostly in in studio at your desk all your friends are around there too so <laughs> and in the opposite side of things what do you think was the hardest decision you made while at ball state huh. hardest decision. Huh. i don't know maybe i mean one of them was probably breaking up with my boyfriend at the current time that i dated through high school and then not all the way through high school but senior year and then he came to Ball State as well and I knew at the time that that wasn't it wasn't going to be a relationship that worked but that was that was probably one of the hardest things you know just kind of having the courage to mm -hmm. do that kind of breakup you know I, I think the first time your real breakup and when you're the one doing it it's always you just feel so bad that you're hurting someone else but you know it's the right thing in the long term, so. And you chose to do a thesis about a master plan of powder horn. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, it's actually um, a former army base uh, in my hometown where they, during uh, World War II, they uh, made um, ammunition there. And so it was ammunition ordinance and it has since been closed and they're no longer using it, but it, at the time it was a, you know, just a big, huge site. I mean, I don't know how many acres at this point, hundreds, probably thousands of acres. And they had been talking about, you know, the state was going to get involved and do redevelopment there, but it was a, a brownfield site, of course, with all the ammunition and ordnance. A lot of it had just been buried basically when they closed they just left and everything was just preserved as is, you know, left there probably in environmentally not in a, in a good situation. So they've since really cleaned that up, but that was just, just getting started at the time. So, um, that's, that's why I looked at that project and really that type of master plan has become what my career has been about. So I haven't done Brownfields work specifically, although I'm still interested in that, but um, type of large scale master planning is, is really what my niche is, so. After you completed that project, do you kind of, did you think that you're gonna be doing that as a full-time career after? No, not really. Um, so I thought, so I did a couple internships during the summers uh, that Ball State um, was very helpful in, in getting lined up for us, you know, they were very encouraging of internships and had a good alumni network to help us find appropriate places. Um, but uh, yeah, so one of my internships was out in Colorado Springs. That was after third year um, working with a, a firm that had some Ball State alumni. And that was landscape architecture related, like more small scale landscape architecture. And then the next summer after the world tour, I interned at TBG in Austin, Texas. And that, that firm did a lot more of this large scale master planning type work. And so that's where I really got more interested in that and felt like that was what I really enjoyed. Um, I also found that in working in those companies, that it was, you know, you realize that it's, the landscape architect is really just doing whatever the client wants, of course, um, but you might have a lot of great ideas, but you can't implement them because you need to do what the client hired you to do and what their budget, within their budget. And so I thought I would really like to get into real estate development and, you know, be able to make the decisions for that. And so that's where I thought, thought my career path would go from there and that's what I went on to graduate school to study so and so talking about grad school you talked uh in your pre-interview notes about a counselor who helped you plan for grad school was that Barb it was Barb yeah okay. yeah yeah and sorry go ahead no um she was very helpful in you know helping me with the essay and just the applications in general and I think really she encouraged me you know i i wanted to go to an ivy league school but i wasn't sure that i had the qualifications and she really encouraged me to 
say, you know, you should definitely apply and, and you stand a good chance and things like that and really made me feel like, okay, I, you know, I should do that. And so that, I, that was very influential in, in my grad school, yeah, choices. <laughs> Were there any other influences on grad school? Um, just, I think that I'd always wanted to go to an Ivy League school, so I thought, <laughs> I'm going to apply. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, and, and just the, you know, the internships really led me down the road to thinking about real estate development and how I, how that might be something that I would enjoy and, and be able to make more decisions about, you know, about projects by working in that field instead of just landscape architecture. So. so where did this interest in Ivy League, kind of the top of the line, where did that come from? <laughs> I don't know. I, I just probably the same that everybody has just thinking, I don't know, wouldn't you love to go to the, the an Ivy League school or the top school? I don't know. <laughs> probably somewhat from my parents. I mean, they, I think they always encouraged my sister and I to, you know, do the, do our best and that you know, you can do anything. So that was probably it. But I just always thought it was really cool and wanted to wanted to try at least. So <laughs> did you even feel like it was in the ballpark of an option for you? Or did you feel like you're like, I, I felt like it was possible, but I, you know, I wasn't sure. I felt like Harvard was probably a stretch. It's like, I don't, I know I'll apply, but I don't think I'm going to get into Harvard, you know, and that was definitely my, my top choice. But I applied to Cornell and because they had a similar program. So I once I focused on real estate, then I looked for the schools that had real estate development programs, which really is not that many that have something in that specific field. So, but the Harvard program really fit with my background because it was based out of the Graduate School of Design. So it, you know, it, it kind of built on what my strengths were and then taking a, a design and yeah, architecture approach to real estate development, so. So what was it like when you first got that email that you were accepted or whatever happened? Yeah, well, I was, I was in studio, <laughs> imagine that. Um, and I, my mom called and she'd gotten the letter in the mail, you know, and she could see it said Harvard on it. And I was like, is it big or small? And she was like, it's pretty big. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, open it. And, you know, she said I got in. And so, and then I, I think I was in studio, but I might have like walked out. And then I walked back in and like told my friend Brian was in there. And I was like, Brian, I got into Harvard <laughs> and <laughs> told him. And then I think I walked down the hall and told some professors. And, you know, it was, yeah, it was an exciting moment. Just that, yeah, just the excitement of, of getting in and thinking that it, it actually happened. So, <laughs> yeah. And what was it like adjusting from Ball State to Harvard? Um, yeah, so I went right after, uh, right after undergrad. Um, and it was an adjustment, you know, in, in Cambridge, in Boston, just different, different area a lot. I think that was one of the biggest adjustments that it was, people were just not very friendly up there. And so that was a big adjustment for me, you know, coming from, Indiana where everyone's pretty friendly and um, you know if you pass somebody on the street you smile at them and it was not so much that way in Boston so that was a big a big factor and and then you know I had some good professors at Harvard and got a good education but I would say that that one-on-one -on -one attention was definitely not there um, especially in the program that I was in and I think a lot of the professors are so focused on their own research and what they were doing. It wasn't as much about the students. Um, and that's probably true. It's more about your classmates at, at that point to some degree. But um, I, I've, it definitely made me appreciate the professors at Ball State that you know gave you that one-on-one -on -one attention and really cared about the students and helping the students and that that was not so much my experience at Harvard. Not that they weren't caring, it was just, you know, you come to class and do the work and do your own thing, so. Do you feel like Ball State adequately prepared you for an Ivy League school? Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Probably particularly some of the honors college classes um, that, yeah, I, I, I felt like I was, I was very well prepared. The, I did take one class, a math class at MIT that was extremely hard. And I didn't take, I don't think I took any math classes while I was here at Ball State because I had credits from high school. So it just been a long time since I'd taken a math class. And so that one was, that one was extra hard, but it probably was intended to be super hard for everyone. So, <laughs> but that was probably, that was one of my hardest classes. And how do you feel like, um, we kind of talked about this just a second ago, but um, like compared to honors classes, how, like what was the rigor comparatively? Like, was it s way harder? You mean honors classes to other to classes? Harvard. Oh, to Harvard. Yeah. No, not way harder. No. Um, I would say similar. Yeah. Very similar. You know, do, do a thoughtful job on, on your papers. And as long as you're keeping yourself organized and, and taking notes in class and, things like that, you can stay on top of it, yeah. Not, and I think that, honestly, the, the high standard that the honors classes set with the amount of reading and the amount of mil materials that you would need to have prepared for each class, I think that, that was a good standard for, for Harvard classes. So you feel like we kind of measure up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um. So what, could you talk to me more about like, the environment of Harvard? What was your social life like at the time? Um, so it was a, the program that I was in, Master's in Design Studies, um, and there were different concentrations that you could have under that, but fairly small program. There were maybe, in my year, there were maybe 15 of us, 10 to 15 of us. So we, we got all we pretty close, and that was an extremely diverse group. Um, there were... Four, four of us were Americans, and then you know there's an Indian guy, a guy from Singapore, from China, from Korea. Um, so a lot of diversity in within that group, um, and so that was that was really good because I didn't meet a lot of people from other countries here at Ball State. You know I didn't have any close friends anyway that were from out of the country. Um, so that, that was really interesting to see everyone's different perspective and especially seeing their struggles, you know, and just imagining how hard they were working coming to do this program in a second language, you know, I, it's just hard to imagine and just have a lot of respect for, for them for going through that experience. So, and, and just recognizing at the time too, that, that thinking this is actually easier for me than it is for, you know, Jung Min because he's doing it in, his English was good, but like, you've got to be at a really high level in order to do a class like that and get through all the reading and just thinking about all of that. So. And how do you think Harvard shaped your plans for the future? Um, I think it opened up a lot of, I think in general, having having a degree from an Ivy League opens doors. I mean, just in general, as as you would expect. Um, I think too, just the the people that I met that I was in class with, um, and seeing what other careers there were out there. I mean, I I think when you're in the College of Architecture and you see you kind of get a narrow view maybe of what the professions that you could do are. And when you get into like the wider world of what else is involved in real estate and, you know, whether it's commercial banking or the, you know, the, the larger scale developers that, you know, managing properties, all that kind of stuff. There's just a lot more options out there that I wasn't aware of. So, and most of my classmates were, um, a little bit older. They had been in the workforce for a few years. And so I was, I think it would have been a little bit more helpful to me to have worked a few years before going to that program. But I, I mean, I'm glad that I just did it because I think it would be really hard to 
work and then go back to grad school. So I think it was, you know, for me anyway, it was best to just go straight through and, and, and finish my education all of the, at the same time. So I think once you get out of, you know, kind of school mode, study mode, I'm sure it's really hard to go back. So. <laughs> and in 2010, you met your husband, or you didn't meet him. You married him. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so when did you meet him? I met him my fifth year, senior year here. Um, he grew up with one of my best friends from Ball State here. She was also in landscape architecture, and uh, she introduced us. And then, yeah, right after the day after I graduated, he had rented a U-Haul and. We moved down to South Carolina where he was starting. Um, he's in the Marine Corps, and that was his first squadron. So he had finished his flight training, and then that was his, his first assignment. So, yeah. Is that how you sort of started to start your own business? Yes, okay. yeah. Yep, it kind of all the, all the moving around with the Marine Corps, everywhere they've taken us has uh, made it, well, real estate is a very – uh, you know, place-based, local type thing. You need to be in the same spot in order to, to get good at that. So that has not been, you know, in my, in my life yet. But <laughs> someday in the future, we'll, I'll get to that when we settle down at some point. But um, yeah, the, right now we are, we are moving where the Marine Corps tells us. So. <laughs> so how do you like? How do you find clientele when you keep moving around? Yeah, so it's kind of, so yeah, so I, we moved to South Carolina and then I went to grad school from there and then we were in South Carolina for another year and a half after I finished grad school. Um, but so I, I made some contacts there and uh, in the, you know, design, urban design, architecture, real estate fields. And I still do some work with them and kind of just made new contacts at each place and try to keep in touch and, and keep, keep, you know, getting contracts from them and get work here and there. So it's, it's been interesting, but it, it's definitely worth it. So <laughs> and how do you kind of build the client experience when you're moving around a lot? Yeah. So it, it does take some, yeah, expectation management, I guess, but you know, because when you first meet somebody and they find out you're a military spouse, I mean, the towns that you live in are used to military spouses for the most part, but they know you're going to leave soon. So you definitely see some discrimination in hiring because they know, well, I'm not going to train this person and then they're going to leave in two years or whenever. Typically, our cycle has been three years, but well, we're on to two year cycles now. So it's not a lot of time to be in a place and, and get to know it. Um, so you just try to like dive in, meet people and get involved as, as quick as you can. So. Is it common to start your own practice in that field? Um, it is common for people to try to find something that's very mobile and that they can they can move with and, and do on their own. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't really know any other military spouses that are in architecture, but, um, yeah, I, it just, it seemed like a way for, for me to continue doing what I enjoy doing and, and being mobile. So, and it, it's worked out great really now that, um, now that we have a daughter and, I can be home with her and work from home, you know, and, and be with her at least for the first couple of years. So that's, that was really my goal. I wanted to have something where I could be with her and, you know, if we have another kid, then I'd like to be home while they're little. So, um, so in your own words, can you describe what the Lehman group is? Yeah. So, um, urban design, master planning, um, real estate and architectural illustration, services. So again, it's kind of, I do a lot of different things because it kind of depends on where I'm at and who I meet and who needs help. <laughs> so I'm, I'm flexible. <laughs> and which of those do you most look forward to doing? Um, all of them in different, the different times. I really, right now I'm doing a lot of master planning and I really enjoy that. Um, I have a contract with the city of Yuma in Arizona 
and I'm, I'm doing some projects with them. Uh, we lived in Yuma um, 2015 through 2017, yeah. And so kind of got involved there and, and doing it's like a, a bikeways plan for the city. And then now I'm working on a, a tree and shade master plan for the city, which is, that's been really interesting and kind of goes back to like all the research that is you know, similar to what you do in classes and, you know, finding all the sources about why trees are beneficial. And the goal is to convince the city council and the residents to educate the residents to some degree about the importance of trees and how they make a difference in the built environment and how we can find funding to add more trees, particularly in a desert city where water is an issue and <laughs> there's really no, you know, if you plant a tree, it is not going to survive on its own. You have to water it. So they get about two inches of rain a year. So it's, and it's the hottest city in the country. So it's a, it's a challenge, but, <laughs> but it's, it, that makes it all the more important. So what's your personal brand and how does that affect the work that you do? Um, I, you know, I think that I try to be just very reliable and professional with all the things I do. And, and so I think that people appreciate that and continue to come back. You know, I, I still work with a real estate developer that I met right out of college, um, and interned and then worked with them for a couple years down in, in South Carolina. And he still sends me stuff, even if it's, even if it's just something small, you know, he trusts that I'll get it done and, and it'll be in a timely manner and, and he can trust the work that I'm doing. So I think that's, that's the most important thing to me. And so you've been doing this for about eight years. How, how have you managed to stay fresh and stay uh, interested? Yeah, I think, well, honestly, I think the moving around a lot helps with that because you're constantly just encountering, you know, the things that, so the design and, and architecture that's happening in South Carolina is pretty progressive in the coastal Carolinas. And there's a lot of, I'm pretty involved with the Congress for the New Urbanism. And there's a lot of that going on in South Carolina. But for example, in Arizona, it really hasn't hit there at all yet. And so those ideas are, you know, you're trying to convince people of, of certain design techniques that they're very resistant to and there's just a different approach to development. So I think that has been one thing that's really kept me interested in this field is that each place has a unique set of set of problems. But sometimes I think that since I've moved around a lot, it I bring a fresh perspective to it because, you know, I've seen what they do on the East Coast versus, you know, out west or and you can trade some of those ideas. Have you ever felt like being a female in this industry has like affected you or been an obstacle for you? No, not really. I don't think so. Um, I would say that especially landscape architecture, it's it's probably, you know, close to 50-50. Um, definitely in, in real estate world, it's, it's more male dominated. But yeah, when it comes to urban design and urban planning, which is really how I would characterize what I do now. Um, it's, no, I would say no real obstacles in that sense. Yeah. You noted on your pre-interview call that this wasn't necessarily the career path you expected. Yeah. What <laughs> What did you expect? Yeah, well, I think I, think I had it in my mind that, uh, well, I certainly didn't expect to move around quite as much as we do. Um, but I definitely envisioned myself more going into an office, you know, maybe if I got into real estate development, starting something and, and really sticking with it over the years, you know, if, if it were any kind of development, mixed use, something, whatever it would be, I pictured myself in, in one place longer. Um, but I'm, I'm thankful that we've moved around a lot and I feel like we've, you know, we've learned a lot and had a lot of fun along the way. So it's, it's definitely worth it. And now I can hardly imagine settling down, so. <laughs> Do you feel like your honors education impacted your ability to 
think freely and to move around freely? I think so, yeah. And I think, I think, because you really do kind of have to reinvent yourself every time you move. Um, and so, so you, I mean, you have to have that confidence in what you do and what you bring to the table, but then also just be willing to pursue something else that is meaningful to you. Like, for example, we moved to Japan. I couldn't really work there. I mean, we don't, we're not, the spouses aren't on a visa that allows you to work. Also, I didn't speak Japanese at the time. So I wasn't going to be working anyway unless, uh, yeah, unless I worked on base or something, um, which there really wasn't anything in my field on base. So I continued doing consulting, but it was, there was definitely that barrier too between people that I knew. Then they're like, well, she's all the way in Japan. And not that people forget, they just feel like you're far away, you know? I mean, you are far away. But yeah, that kind of became a, a hindrance to some degree. I mean, I think you need some face-to-face -face contact with your clients in order to make it work. So mm -hmm. that was that was interesting. But I, I decided to pursue learning Japanese. So I took a class for the first year that we were there, year and a half that we were there, like an all-day, every-day in immersive learning Japanese class. So that was, that was a great experience. I mean, that was, and that was, I would say that was the hardest class I've ever taken. <laughs> that was, I mean, I think I came home the first few days, came home crying to my husband, like, this is so hard. I have no idea what's going on. Cause it was in all Japanese from day one. There was no English. The other students were from all over the world, mostly, mostly Chinese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Taiwan, um, and so almost no one else in the class spoke any English, so we couldn't communicate with each other at all for like the first couple months until we could, you know, say the basics like, "What are you eating for lunch?" or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then, yeah, so that was that was an interesting experience, but but it made our time in in Japan so much better to be able to understand. The language and get to know people better and just showing that you're coming to the country and you're trying you know that you're trying to understand their culture and and be part of it because a lot of people a lot of Japanese people speak some English and you know would like to learn more English especially in the town that we were where there's so many Americans associated with the base so And I also found that you have an Etsy shop. When did that come into play? Oh, yeah, actually in Japan, I think. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, I was just kind of looking for all sorts of things, you know, things to do and things to keep me creatively engaged. And, yeah, so I started doing, doing some of that. Yeah. <laughs> And I was looking up um, places for your feature with your work, things like that. And you were actually among like the Rifle Paper Company and like really well-known brands. So what kind of um, recognition do you feel like you've received? Um, yeah, so I guess it's been a couple of years since I really focused just on artwork. I That was mainly when I was in Japan and I really pursued like being in publications, um, you know, illustrating articles for different publications and and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, what else? I did have a, a world map that I drew was featured uh, on in Condé Nast. That was cool. Um, and then I, I did some illustrations for the for the Southern Living and uh, Coastal Living, the Idea Houses this past year. So that was that was fun to be. And that was actually through a contact that someone I, an architect that I'd met in. Uh, in South Carolina that recommended me for that. So it's kind of, yeah, all the people you meet kind of <laughs> come back and, and create your your network. So it's, it's good to have a wide network if, if not always, you know, the, the deepest <laughs> connections, but yeah. That was my next question was like, how do you get this wide variety of work? How do you solicit employers? Yeah, it's mainly word of mouth, um, but I'm, yeah, it's it's really mainly people that I've worked with in the past. And then, like, right now I'm trying to get a contract with a firm that a guy I used to work with that he now works for this firm. And 
I'm hoping to do some consulting with them. And yeah, it's, it's mostly repeat people that I've worked with. So that, that has kept me pretty busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where's like the main source of inspiration for your work? Um, I would say probably Congress for the New Urbanism is probably the biggest influencer of, of the ideas that I, I try to, to do in, in my work. Um, also, I'm a big proponent of strong towns, which is um, kind of an, I, I don't know, maybe a philosophy, but it, it's a blog as well, but, um, and a group of people that are trying to promote more, you know, fiscally responsible decisions by cities and things that, you know, rather than doing a lot of big projects or investing in too much infrastructure, like, you know, you see huge parking lots that are largely empty and, and trying to encourage a, a better, more sustainable form of, of our built environment. And I also found that you have received a pretty good amount of achievement or awards. What was what was the biggest one for you? Huh. Um, probably um, the a project that I worked on with the city of Beaufort while we were there. That one got um, a charter award from the Congress for the New Urbanism, which is one of their highest levels of awards. Um, so that was that was a, a great honor. And then one of the plans that I wrote in Yuma got an Arizona American Planning Association award. And that was, that was, I was proud of that achievement too. So as you look back on kind of the path that you've taken, how do you feel like Ball State has enabled you to do all of these things? I think a lot of the connections, you know, um, I still have a lot of connections with a lot of my classmates, a lot of other alumni. Um, and although I haven't, you know, with moving around a lot, I haven't encountered a lot of other Ball State grads. Um, I still feel like it's, you know, a well-respected program, well-respected degree. And, and I think just all, I, all my professors, you know, really, I feel like I had just had a really good education and was well-prepared for things that, that came about, that have come about in in my professional life. And in 2018, you had your baby. Yep. <laughs> so how did that change everything? Yeah, yeah, uh, it did. Um, it didn't, it didn't, I guess. You know, you, you think it's going to change everything, but it's, I don't know, it, she's, she's just the happiest little baby, so I guess we've had it really easy, actually. So it hasn't changed everything, but um, <laughs> she's, you know, we're not sleep deprived or <laughs> anything like that. Um, yeah, I think it just, and kind of like I mentioned, I wanted to be at home with her while, while the kids are little, I want to be able to be home with them and, and raising them. So I think that this, the flexible career that I am in now, I am able to do that. And, you know, I get up early, work for a couple hours and then hang out with her. And then during her naps, I work and, and then, you know, finish up in the evening if there's anything else I need to wrap up. So it's it's a good, you know, work-life balance. I think that, you know, life is much more important than work in, in all instances. So I think that I had this vision of, like, what my career was going to be. And I, you know, our lifestyle now, it's not what I envisioned, but it's better than that. You know, it's it's... Yeah, it's, it's more fulfilling than just a, a career would be, so. What do you see happening in the future? Do you see yourself trying to settle down more and keep moving around? Yeah, I mean, I think eventually we'll settle down. Um, my husband, let's see, he's been in almost 15 years, um, so I, he'll probably retire at 20. I don't think we'll stay in longer than that, <laughs> um, but it's... You know, I think that he has followed the career that he has always dreamt of. So it's been, yeah, I, I think it's important, especially in a family that if, if, 
if one person is going to like follow their dream career, like if you're going to be a family, like somebody's got to be willing to kind of go along and, and make it work. So I think that dynamic might kind of switch once we, once he's out of the, the Marine Corps and, and, you know, it might be more, I don't know, but I think we'll be, we'll make decisions together, obviously, which we always do, but I think it, it, I might focus more on, on the real estate, real estate development side. And well, and at that point, you know, our kids will be in school and, you know, more time to, to focus on, on professional life. So (laughs) where do you see yourself? Like what would be like the dream um, location? That's a great question. Yeah. (laughs) I really don't know. (laughs) Yeah. We, we talk about that a lot and yeah, it's hard to say. I think especially like when you move around and you see, you see great things about each place, you see great things and you see things that you don't like about each place, but I don't know that there's any one place that has all the great things and none of the bad things, right? So yeah, I think, you know, like in Arizona, you get totally addicted to the sun and you come back in the Midwest and you're like, oh my gosh, it's so gray. <laughs> and. So that's one thing I would like more sun, but yeah, who knows? So we may never settle down a hundred percent. And as you walked back onto Ball State's campus today, what emotions and feelings came back? Yeah, I think even just driving up here, you know, like driving into Muncie and just a lot of memories of a lot of friends. And I think that's, that's probably my, the biggest thing that came back was just all, you know, time spent with friends and, and, and just walking around campus, like all the, yeah, just a lot of, a lot of great experiences and a lot of interesting classes and just stuff that you hadn't thought about in a long time. So. What do you feel like the Honors College has done for you post school? Uh, post school. I don't know. I guess I I hadn't had a lot of interaction with the honors college, you know, specifically since graduation. Um, I was actually when I got the letter about this project, I was actually surprised that they had found my address with <laughs> as much as we'd moved. <laughs> I was pretty impressed that they had had my address. So. And maybe I updated it somewhere. I don't know, but <laughs> usually, you know, everything's going to two or three addresses ago. So, um, yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to the project? No, I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> okay. Well, on behalf of the Boston University Honors College Oral History Project, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much.